um, will be in 2 Samuel chapter 15, and we're going to go all the way through 16, chapter 16, verse 14. And I've titled today's message, Hey Dad, Look at Me Now. Now, it's one thing to experience God's power when you're facing giants or fighting armies and quite something else when you're watching people tear your world apart. After the events of chapter 12, God had been chastening David. But David knew this throughout this entire time. He knew that God's power could help him in the hour of pain as well as the hour of conquest. He wrote in one of his exile psalms, Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. David recognized that God's loving hand of discipline was upon him. And he admittedly deserved every blow. But he also believed that God's gracious hand of power was still at work in his life. And that the Lord hadn't forsaken him as he had forsaken Saul. The Lord was still working out his perfect will. And never did David rise to greater heights of faith and submission than when he was forced to leave Jerusalem and flee to hide in the wilderness once again. We're going to see how a son overthrew his father's authority. And then, again, afterwards, we're going to be seeing how, again, he he readily admitted that he deserved what he was getting. So, before we get into the first part of today's uh, passage, let's ask God to speak to us. Lord God, I we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning to gather together to worship you. And, and now, Lord, to sit at your feet and hear your word, Lord. We know and believe without a doubt that you have a message for each and each every, and every one of us, Lord. That your word is powerful, it's living, it's active. And that even though this story may seem irrelevant to our lives, Lord, um, there is something there that you, within this story that you have to say to each and every person that's sitting here, that's watching, that's listening. So now use me as your vessel, use me as your instrument to speak powerfully to speak your truth lord we love you lord pray this in jesus name amen yeah this these allergies kind of throw me off all kinds of different directions so this is this is actually a first for me these five years where it's been this bad so excuse the sniffing sorry all right so oh okay i'll get through this i'll get through this second samuel chapter 15. And the word of God says there, After this, Absalom got himself a chariot, horses, and fifty men to run before him. He would get up early and stand beside the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone had a grievance to bring before the king for, for settlement, Absalom, Absalom called out to him and asked, What city are you from? If he replied, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel, Absalom said to him, look, your claims are good and right, but the king does not have anyone to listen to you. He added, if only someone would appoint me judge in the land, then anyone who had a grievance or dispute, dispute could come to me, and I would make sure he received justice. When a person approached to pay homage to him, Absalom reached out his hand, took hold of him, and kissed him. Absalom did this 
to all the Israelites who came to the king for a settlement. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. When four years had passed, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron to fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. For your servant made a vow when I, was, when I lived in Geshur of Aram, saying, If the Lord really brings me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. Go in peace, the king said to him. So he went to Hebron. When Absalom sent agents throughout the tribes of Israel, uh, then Ab Absalom sent uh, agents throughout the tribes of Israel with this message. When you hear the sound of the ram's horn, you are to say, Absalom has become king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem went with Absalom. They had been invited and were going innocently for they did not know the whole situation. While he was offering the sacrifices, Absalom sent for David's advisor, Ahithophel, the, the Gileonite, from his city of Gilo. So the conspiracy grew strong, and the people supporting Absalom continued to increase. Then an informer came to David and reported, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to the servants with him in Jerusalem, Get up! We have to flee, or we will not escape Absalom. Leave quickly, or he will overtake us quickly. He will heap disaster on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. The king's servants said to the king, Whatever my lord the king decides, we are your servants. Then the king set out, and his entire household followed him. <coughs> but he left behind ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out, and all the people followed him. They stopped at the last house while all his servants marched past them. Then all the Chariothites, the Pelethites, and the people of Gath, 600 men who came with them from there, marched past the king. The king said to Atai of Gath, Why are you going with us? Go back and stay with the new king since you're both a foreigner and an exile from your homeland. Besides, you only arrived yesterday. Should I make you wander around with us today while I go wherever I can? Go back and take your brothers with you. May the Lord show, show you kindness and faithfulness. But in response, Atai bowed to the king. As the Lord lives and as my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king is, wherever it means, whether it means life or death, your servant will be there. March on, David replied to Atai. So Atai of Gath marched past with all, the, with all his men and the dependents who were with him. Everyone in the countryside was weeping loudly with, while all the people were marching out of the city. As the king was crossing Kid, Kidron, the Kidron Valley, all the people were marching past the road that leads to the wilderness. Zadok was also there, and all the Levites with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set the Ark of God down, and Abiathar offered sacrifices until the people had finished marching past. Then the king instructed Zadok, Return the Ark to the city. If I find, if I find favor with the Lord, he will bring me back and allow me to see both it and its dwelling place. However, if he should say, I do not, I do not delight in you, then here I am. He can do with me whatever he pleases. The king said to the priest Zadok, Look, return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, your son Ahimaaz and Abiathar, and Abiathar's son Jonathan. Remember, I'll wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and stayed there. David was climbing the slope of the mountain of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he ascended. His head was covered, and he was walking barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they ascended. Then someone reported to David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Lord, David pleaded, pleaded, 
please turn the counsel of, of Ahithophel into foolishness. Then David, then David came to the summit where he used to worship God. Hushai, the, the archite, was there to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you go away with me, you'll be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and tell Absalom, I will be your servant, your majesty. Previously, I was your father's servant, but now I'll be your servant. Then you can counteract Ahithophel's counsel for me. Won't the priests Zadok and Abiathar be there with you? Report everything you hear from the palace to the priests Zadok and Abiathar. Take note, their two sons are there with them, Zadok's son Ahimaaz and Abiathar's son Jonathan. Send them to tell me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's personal advisor, entered Jerusalem just as Absalom was entering the city. Wow, you know, I have um, two boys. You know, seeing my, my boys from babies growing up into young men, it's just been an amazing thing to witness. But I can't imagine if they ever, them ever betraying me. But it's, it must have been just really difficult for David to see this son of his, whom he probably held in his arms. Now, do this. If ever there was a man equipped to be a demagogue and lead people astray, that man was Absalom. According to the information we've been given in chapters 13 and 14, we're told that he was flawlessly handsome, not a flaw from toe to head. He was charming. And he had royal blood in his veins from both his father and his mother. Yet in spite of the fact that he appeared on the outside to have all the features of a storybook prince, he lacked one trait that, made, that would have made him a great king and a great leader. Character. And like many past and present leaders, people will often look a person's character if they're told what they want to hear and given what they want to have. Newspaper editor H.L. Mencken's definition of a demagogue is rather extreme, but he gets the point across. One who preaches doctrines he knows to be untrue to men he knows to be idiots. Novelist James Fenimore Cooper expressed it accurately. One who advances his own interests by affecting a deep devotion to the interests of the people. Well, in addition to being a straight out pathological liar and manipulative, Absalom was also a patient man who was able to discern when the right moment was to act. Last week, we read how he waited two years to murder his half-brother Amnon. And now, as we just read, he waited four years before rebelling against his father and seizing the throne with great skill. The, that egotistical prince used every device at his disposal to mesmerize the people and win their support. But that wasn't, see, that wasn't the case with David. He didn't have to use these tricks. David had won the hearts of the people through sacrifice and service. They knew and were aware about his blood, sweat, and tears but not Absalom. Absalom did it the easy way by manufacturing an image of himself that the people just couldn't resist. David was a hero. Absalom was only a celebrity. And because of this, many of the people had gotten accustomed to their king, 
to David and had now taken him for granted. Now, the theme of the first six verses is the summarizing statement that Absalom stole the hearts of the Israelites. The problem, though, is, is that our English use of heart may mistakenly lead us to believe that Absalom had the ability to, to attract the affections of the people. But in the Old Testament, the word heart was often used to describe the seat of one's intellect as well as one's emotions. Thus, the phrase itself, stole the hearts, is actually implying that rather than winning the affections of the Israelites, Absalom stole their minds. That is, he deceived or duped them. Verses 1 through 6 is the account of the precise strategies Absalom uses in his seditious efforts to deceive and distort in order to overthrow David. So we're told there that he employs three strategies to begin building support to overthrow his father. First, we see that he got himself a chariot, horses, and 50 men to run before him. By doing this, he was giving, he was being a show off. It would give him the appearance of being a royal leader who had that military presence so that people could think that he was strong enough to protect and defend the people. Second, he would get up early and stand beside the road leading to the city gate. And there he would put himself in a position and role of judge for the people. See, by standing there and hearing their grievances and, and re-examining their cases, he came across as a leader who wanted justice, who wanted justice for the people, who felt like David, his father, just didn't have time to, to really hear what's going on with everyone. And, and so he sat there listening, pretending, again, pay, to pay attention, to hear him out. But the thing is, he couldn't do anything. He, he told them, there's really nothing I can do because my hands are tied. If only I was judge. If only I was king, I'd be able to do more. So he started to put these seeds in their minds about what it would look like if he was in charge. And his third strategy was to receive anyone who approached him to pay homage to him. It was a gross flattery of the most despicable kind. And the more he played the part of king, the more people were just loving it. The more they were just enthralled, the more they were like, yes, give us more. And, oh, you know, that's, you look it, you act it, you're beautiful, you're charming. Wow. You would make a great king. The people just were loving every part of it. Well, after four years of building his base, we learn that Absalom then requested and received permission from the king to go to Hebron, allegedly to pay a vow to the Lord, which he had made while he was in exile in Geshur. That was that location where he went to go live with his grandfather and where after he had killed his brother, that's where he went to go live. And he said while he was there, he made a vow to the Lord that he wanted to keep. During those four years, he had been slowly weaning the people away from David and waited for the right opportunity to overturn his father's authority. And finally, 
that time had come. When Absalom reached Hebron, the very center of the Davidic dynasty, where David had begun his reign, Absalom shocked the entire kingdom. Unbeknownst to the 200 men who, were, who went there with him, he announced the formation of a new government with himself as the king. Now, these 200 men, they could have said something. They could have objected. They could have just left you know, him there and been like, oh, you're crazy, and gone back to Jerusalem. But they're in action shows that they were apparently fine with it. They, they saw like, oh yeah, this makes sense. They didn't see there was any point of objecting. It, it kind of just seemed like the right thing to do. Especially when they noticed that Absalom had the support of Ahithophel, David's best advisor. Now, some have suggested that it was probably Ahithophel who masterminded this entire operation. Now, why is that? Well, according to verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 34, Ahithophel's granddaughter was Bathsheba, the woman who David had violated and who had her, and had her husband killed. So this may have been his great opportunity to avenge himself on David. But here's the thing, though. By doing this, by supporting Absalom, he was also rejecting Bathsheba's son Solomon, whom God would eventually choose to be the next king after David. At the same time, Ahithophel was taking steps towards his own death. See, like Judas, he rejected the true king. And when we get to chapter 17, we're going to see that he too went out like Judas and committed suicide. But for now, by double-crossing his king, he was now sinning against the Lord who had chosen David. Well, David has to go. He has to flee. He has no choice. He, 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 he knows that that's, it's the best thing to do. He can stay there and fight his son. His, and this is what boggles the mind too, is that David knew that this wasn't going to be a, a diplomatic effort. He couldn't just sit down with his son and work things out. No. Both of them Absalom and David knew that, that in order for him to be, to be the king, he'd, David would have to die. So, so David knew. He had, to, he had to go. You learn in verses 13 to 23 that news quickly reached the capital, that Absalom had effected a coup, and that all was lost. David, convinced of the hopelessness of his cause, and anxious to spare the city from destruction, made plans to once again flee. Leaving behind ten concubines to take care of the palace, he, along with all the people, those that were in the city and hadn't gone with, with Absalom, including 600 Philistines who had followed him all the way from Gath, the city that he had lived in, the Philistine city that he had lived in, prior to returning to Jerusalem himself, they followed him. They followed him and, and fled the city. He also tried to persuade his, Philist, the Philist, his Philistine mercenary officer, Atai, to remain behind since he had nothing to fear from Absalom. He said, You'll be, you'll be fine. You'll be okay here. Why do you want to go out to the wilderness with me? You'll be comfortable here. Stay. But to his credit, Atai refused. 
preferring to honor his commitment of loyalty, joining the king in banishment. Atai was loyal to David when it looked certain that it would, co- that it would cost him something. See, friends, true loyalty isn't demonstrated until it's likely to cost something to be loyal. So, as I look at what Atai had done and what he did, his loyalty, I found some ways that, some things about what he did that can show us also what loyalty is, how he demonstrated loyalty so we can learn from him as well. Atai did it when David was down. He was loyal when David was down. He did it decisively. He did it voluntarily. He did it having just come to David. He did it publicly. And Atai did it knowing that the fate of David would become his fate. David, I mean, Atai was loyal. As Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, you must determine that wherever Jesus is, you will be also. See, he lives right now in the heavenlies. So will you. He is with his church. So are you. He is busy in his work. And so should you. He is with his children. And so should we. We must determine this as followers. If we truly claim to be followers of Jesus is that we follow him wherever he goes. And regardless of what happens, to not say, you know what, I, I'll follow you up to a certain point, but when it gets too tough, when it gets too hairy, when it gets too difficult, I'm just going to back away and let you do your thing. I'm going to go home. No, we have to follow him the entire way. We all should have that same kind of faith, that same kind of devotion that same kind of conviction that no matter what may happen to us, regardless of what the world throws at us, regardless of what the, this country may look like in five, ten years from now, the Lord will be with us. He'll be protecting us. And if we die for His name, in His name, man, that is a glorious death. And so now, as we mentioned earlier, for the second time of his life, David is forced to flee. He's forced to flee into the wilderness to save his life. As a young man, he fled the jealous rage of King Saul. And now he was seeking refuge from the hypocritical deceptions of his son Absalom and his former advisor, Ahithophel. Thereafter, Zadok and Abiathar, the two, his two chief priests, were sent back to Jerusalem by David. He knew that if it was God's will for him to return as king, he would do so. Hence, there was no need to keep the ark away from the sanctuary. After all, It was David and not the Lord who was going into exile. David assigned the two priests to be the eyes and ears in Jerusalem and to send him all the information that would help him plan his strategy. Zadok's son Ahimaaz and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, would be the messengers to bring the information to him. And this was actually kind of smart because 
you know, if both of their messages coincided with, with one another, they, they were the same, he knew that the information was accurate. But if their information didn't match up, then he knew that there was something fishy going on. See, David also was smart enough to know that his son wouldn't dare lay hands on the Lord's priests. Thus, they could go about their work almost unnoticed. Plus, seeing the two priests and their sons return to Jerusalem with the ark would have been interpreted as four important, four more important supporters of the new king. In the meantime, David and all those who backed him made their way east across the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives with his head covered and walking barefoot. Those two signs there indicated his depth of despair. And as he ascended, he and his followers left behind trails of tears along the way. And I'm sure the city itself could hear the sounds of just loud weeping. When Jesus went from the Last Supper up to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he essentially traced these same steps of David. Both David and Jesus suffered for sin. But Jesus suffered for our sins, and David suffered for his own. And what was it that Jesus did while he was up in there in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed. He prayed for his followers. He prayed for his disciples. But also he prayed for us. He prayed for you and for me that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. David prayed too. He prayed for intervention. I'll speak in that, about that in just a second. But to make matters worse about this entire situation, David finally discovered that his trusted advisor, Ahithophel, had joined Absalom's cause. See, throughout David's entire lifetime, he cried many tears of pain, loss, and just sorrow. But these tears that he was crying now were much deeper. See, he wasn't just concerned for the welfare of his rebellious son. He was also worried for the safety of the nation. But what kept them going, you know, taking each step going forward, going up that mountain, was the mission that God had for Israel to the world. See, God's covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 not only assured him that his throne would last forever, but the promise also implied that Israel wouldn't be destroyed or the lamp of David permanently extinguished. It would go on forever. So although, yes, he was heartbroken, he was crushed, he knew God would be faithful to keep his covenant, and that his throne would be safe in the hands of the Lord. And so when he got to the summit, the Lord met him there by answering a prayer, a specific prayer that he had. There at the, at the top of the, of the mountain there was a friend who again was the answer to the prayer that he prayed at the end of verse 31. Lord, David pleaded, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Well, that prayer was answered in verse 32 when he saw his good friend Hushai. Seeing him also visibly heartbroken about the events that were transpiring, the events that were occurring, and when he heard that he also wanted to go away with David, the king offered him a better alternative. 
He persuaded, he persuaded Hushai to return to Jerusalem and attach himself to Absalom's court as an advisor. There, he'd be able to not only disrupt Ahithophel's counsel, but he would be in a position to know Absalom's plans and communicate them to Zadok and Abiathar, whose sons, in turn, would relay them to David. See, the idea was to cause turmoil within Absalom's inner circle, frustrate his plans, and give David the assurance that he was getting reliable intelligence from two reliable sources. Hushai agreed to help, and he did it just in time, because as soon as he entered Jerusalem, Absalom was also entering as well. See, if he was seen just entering the city after Absalom had entered, he wouldn't have been trusted. He would have been, people would have been talking and wondering, did you see David right before this? Is that why you're late? Is that why you're not here? Is that why we didn't see you this entire time? It would raise doubts. And he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been allowed to be in Absalom's inner circle. Now, usually I end at the end of the chapter of a chapter, but because the first 15 verses of chapter 16 ties in with chapter 15, it's important that we cover it. So turn with me back to 2 Samuel and follow along as I read the first 14 verses of chapter 16. 2 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 1. When David had gone a little beyond the summit, Ziba, Mephibosheth's servant, was right there to meet him. He had a pair of saddle donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 branches of summer fruit, and a clay jar of wine. The king said to Ziba, Why do you have these? Ziba, Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride. The bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat. And the wine is for those to drink who become exhausted in the wilderness. Where is your master's grandson? The king asked. Why, he's... Why, he's staying in Jerusalem, Ziba replied to the king. For he said, today the house of Israel will restore my grandfather's kingdom to me. The king said to Ziba, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is now yours. I'll bow before you, Ziba said. May I find favor with you, my lord the king. When King David got to Bahurim, a man belonging to the family of the house of Saul, was just coming out. His name was Shimei, son of Gera, and he was yelling curses as he approached. He threw stones at David and all the royal servants, the people, and the warriors on David's right and left. Shimei said as he cursed, Get out! Get out! You man of bloodshed! You wicked man! The Lord has paid you back for all the blood of the house of Saul who would place you, the house of Saul whose place you became king. And the Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son, Absalom. Look, you're in trouble because you're a man of bloodshed. Then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and remove his head. The king replied, Sons of Zeruah, do we agree on anything? He curses, me on, he curses me this way because the Lord told him, Curse David. <coughs> Therefore, who can say, Why did you do that? Then David said to Abishai and all his servants, Look, my own son, my own flesh and blood intends to take my life. How much more now? This Benjamite, leave him alone and let him curse me. The Lord has told him to. 
Perhaps the Lord will see my affliction and restore goodness to me instead of Shimei's curses today. So David and his men proceeded along the road as Shimei was going along the ridge of the hill opposite him. As Shimei went, he cursed David, threw stones at him, and kicked up dust. Finally, the king and all the people with him arrived exhausted, and so they rested there. When David met Hushai, it was the answer to a prayer. But when David now met Ziba, Ziba, oh my goodness, what can we say about him? He's, he was a liar, nothing but a big, horrible, terrible liar. And when he met him, the encounter created a problem that unfortunately wasn't settled until David returned to the throne. Ziba had been one of Saul, the previous king's, one of his land managers, as well as a custodian of Jonathan's triple son, Mephibosheth. But he was an opportunist with evil motives. And David knew this. He was aware of this. After everything that he saw, now him bringing the, the king, he, David knew this and was suspicious about Ziba's presence, his gifts, and more importantly, the absence of Mephibosheth, who David looked after. Ziba had brought a pair of saddle donkeys for David and his family to use, as well as a generous amounts, a generous amounts of bread, wine, and fruit. These, these gifts were needed and they were appreciated but David was concerned about the motive behind them. Ziba lied to the king. And he did his best to discredit his young master, Mephibosheth. And sadly, because David was just tired of everything that was going on, he was on the move, he was running as a, you know, maybe his adrenaline started to, to go down and he was hungry and frustrated with everything. And he was just hurt deep inside. It wasn't really the best time to make character decisions. And as a result, he unfortunately accepted Ziba's story. He believed a lie, which was later discredited. And we'll read about that when we get to chapter 19. But he made a rash judgment. They gave Ziba the property that rightfully belonged to Mephibosheth. So do you see what Ziba was trying to do there? He knew what, what he was there to get. He also was manipulating the situation. He knew Mephibosheth couldn't walk. He knew that he was crippled. He couldn't take him with him. He couldn't defend himself. And so he used this whole situation to get what he wanted out of the king. He also was aware that the king was tired and that's why he brought him all kinds of food and he brought him donkeys and to sit on. He made, David made a rash judgment. And unfortunately, you know, he would have to do something about it later on. But it says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13, that the one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness. And a disgrace for him. This is an important. This is important for anyone who feels that they've been called to begin or take over a ministry within the church, or or just in leadership in general. See, leaders and especially God's leaders must consistently be on guard, lest they make unwise decisions based on incomplete information. The idea here is this. Hear and know the entire story, both sides of the story, before making a decision one way or the other. Well, because of Ziba's lies, 
Satan attacked David as a certain as a certain as a serpent who deceives. And then through Shimei's words and stones, Satan came as a lion who devours. Ziba told lies and Shimei threw stones. And both were making it hard for David. We're told in verse 5 that when the king got to Bahurim, he was met by a man named Shimei, who was a distant relative of Saul. Shimei was in a hillside opposite David and above him. And it was easy for him to throw stones and clumps of dirt at David and his people. David was exhausted and discouraged. And yet, even though he was feeling this way, in that state, he never rose to greater heights than when he allowed Shimei to go on attacking him. Now Abishai, one of David's commanders, on the other hand, was only too willing to cross over to get on top of that, uh, that hill, hillside and kill the man who was attacking the king. But David wouldn't allow it. He's on no, don't. Don't even bother. See, in 1 Samuel chapter 26, Abishai had also wanted to kill Saul in the camp of Israel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 3, he also assisted his brother Joab in murdering Abner. So David knew that his words were not to be treated lightly. He knew that Abishai was, was serious and he would follow through with going up there and killing and attacking and killing that man. Get out. Get out, you man of bloodshed. You wicked man, shouted Shimei in verse 7. But David didn't retaliate. See, Shimei was blaming David for the death of Saul and his sons. For after all, David was was officially in the Philistine army when they died. The fact that David was miles away from the battlefield when their deaths occurred didn't seem to matter to Shimei. The loyal Benjamite probably blamed David for the death of Saul's son, Ishibosheth, who inherited Saul's throne and also Abner, Saul's loyal commander, and of course, Uriah the Hittite as well. He then told David in verse 8, The Lord has paid you back for all the blood of the house of Saul. You are in trouble because you're a man of bloodshed. And remember, he's also, as this is going on, he's also calling curses on him. But here's the thing. Shimei himself was breaking the law while venting out his hatred on David. Exodus chapter 22 verse 20, Exodus chapter 22 verse 28 says, "You must not blaspheme God or curse a leader among your people." Try remembering this verse next time you feel like venting out to one of your elected leaders, one of our elected leaders that you see on TV or on the radio. Well, David's attitude, though, was one of submission because he accepted Shimei's abuse as, it was, as, as from the hand of God himself. In, verse 15, in, in chapter 15, verse 26, David had already announced that he would accept anything the Lord sent him, and now he proved it. He was walking the talk. When David considered that he was an adulterer, and a murderer who deserved to die, yet God let him live. Why should he complain about some stones and some dirt? And if Absalom, David's own son, was out to kill him, why should a total stranger be punished for slandering the king and throwing things at him? David had faith that God would one day balance the books and take care of people like Abishai, or Absalom, and Shimei. And perhaps David was thinking of what it said in Deuter- what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. 
where God says, vengeance and retribution belong to me. When David later regained the throne, he pardoned Shimei in verse 19. And later, Solomon restricted him to Jerusalem where he could be watched. But when Shimei arrogantly overstepped his bounds in 1 Kings chapter 2, it says there that he was arrested and executed. Well, David and the people went beyond Behurim, some 20 miles to the ford of the Jordan River, possibly near Gilgal or Jericho, and there they rested. Very early in the morning, they crossed the river and proceeded on to Mahanaim. And there, that place is important because that's where Jacob had prepared to meet his brother Esau and had also wrestled with God. And perhaps David remembered that event and gained courage as he thought of the army of angels that God sent to protect Jacob. So what did all this suffering accomplish for David? It made him more like Jesus. See, he was rejected by his own people and betrayed by his own familiar friend. He gave up everything for the sake of the people and would have surrendered his own life to save his rebellious son who deserved to die. Like Jesus, David crossed the Kindron Valley and went up to the mount and went up Mount Olivet. He was falsely accused and shamefully treated. And yet he submitted to the for, to the sovereign will of God, who, when he was insulted, did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the woman who judges justly. David, yes, he lost his throne. But Jehovah God was still on the throne and would keep his promises with his servant. Faithful to his covenant, the Lord remembered David and all the hardships that he endured. Let me tell you this. He remembers you today as well. He has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten your hardships. He has not forgotten all the things that you've had to endure, all the things that you've suffered for the name of Christ. All the times that people have laughed at you, have mocked you, have ridiculed you, he doesn't forget. Just endure. And as you endure, don't forget that he's with you during those hardships. The story here also, as I close now, also shows us that, in a sense, we're all like Absalom before we come to Christ. We've all rebelling. We all are trying to upsurp God's authority. We all believe we know better. Before knowing Christ, we think that we're, we can do better. We think that we, I don't know, we're smarter, more wiser than God. We think that we can we know what's best for our own lives. We want to take charge. We want to be the king of our lives. But God knows how silly and foolish that is. Come to the Lord before it's too late. Understand and know that you're not in charge. God is greater. God is bigger. God is sovereign. He's omnipotent. He knows everything. He's bigger than what you can ever think or imagine. God created you, not the other way around. And one day, the Bible tells us that every knee will bow. And if you die in your rebellion, if you die in that state of wanting to of just rebelliousness, he will judge you. And it's not going to be pretty when that happens. So, 
if you're ready to be forgiven of your sins, if you're ready to come to the Lord and, and humble yourself and admit that you're not in charge, that God is, that God's Son came down to die for their sins. So if you're ready to be forgiven, I want to lead you in a prayer to, to do that. Just close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you genuinely and sincerely pray that, welcome to the family of God. Your sins have been forgiven. They've been wiped clean. You have a clean slate. If you were to die this very moment, you'd be present before God and He would not judge you for any of your sins, past, present, or future. But you're forgiven because of His Son. So if you prayed that, let us know. Contact us if you want to be in your next, ex next steps of your Christian walk. If you're here locally, we want to invite you to come visit us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. But um, yeah, this is going to be a, an amazing time, amazing adventure. It's going to be ups and downs, valleys and deserts, but the Lord will be with you the entire way, just as, just as he was with David. Thank you for watching and spending time uh, with us. Thank you for putting up with my allergies. Uh, hopefully next week it'll be a lot better. Have an amazing, wonderful week. May the Lord keep you safe, healthy. Um, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. We love you.